Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India series in renal pathology and today we are going to be talking about interstitial nephritis. So if you look at the first slide here we can see what the normal kidney looks like and if you look at the yellow arrow there is the proximal convoluted tribule with its abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. There you have the distal convoluted tribule with more cuboidal lining cells, more packed nuclei and less amount of cytoplasm. So that's the normal tubules that you see in the cortex and you can see that they are really back to back. And so the interstitium is really just a potential space between these tubules. This is a mason strikeform stain section. We're still seeing what the normal kidney looks like. But as it's obvious that the tubules and interstitium are so intimately associated, whenever there is any pathology, they tend to affect both together and we put them together under tubulointerstitial diseases. So one very important tubulointerstitial disease is tubulointerstitial nephritis. And how would we define this? It's a group of renal diseases characterized by both histologic and functional alterations that involve the tubules and interstitium. We can classify them in various ways as primary or secondary, acute or chronic, or based on the cause. So let's look at it in terms of primary or secondary. Secondary TIN can occur secondary to diseases of other compartments of the kidney. So it could be secondary to a glomerular disease or a vascular disease or a cystic disease of the kidney or metabolic diseases like diabetes. So here for you, we've got a renal biopsy from a patient. He's a 45 year old male presented with nephrotic syndrome. And as is clear from the biopsy, you can see that the predominant involvement is really in the glomeruli. They're replaced by abundant eosinophilic material which displayed beautiful apple green birefringence and a polarized light in a Congo red stain section. So we have our diagnosis. This is a case of glomerular or renal amyloidosis. Uh, but if you concentrate on the tubular interstitium, you can see it's not normal. You have tubules which are now very small and atrophic and what we call thyroidized. And the interstitium is expanded by collagen along with this chronic inflammatory infiltrate. So you have a secondary tubular interstitial involvement in a primary glomerular disease. So why is this so important? It's really important for the clinician when the patient comes in to understand where the problem is starting from. Is it a primary glomerular or primary tubular interstitial? And they look for certain features. For example, absence of nephritic or nephrotic syndrome, which is a hallmark of glomerular injury, presence of defects in tubular function in the form of polyuria, nocturia, salt wasting, metabolic acidosis, or if there is some proteinuria which is really mild, 1 plus on the dipstick, less than 1 gram on 24 hour urine protein examination, suggestive of tubular proteinuria. So these are the initial clinical findings which help in differentiating primary glomerular versus tubular interstitial. And there's a very important role played by urine sediment examination. We'll look at that in subsequent slides. But what we must understand that once the patient is in end-stage renal disease, really it's very difficult for either the clinician or the pathologist to differentiate where the primary event started from. So as a pathologist, we routinely look at urine sediments from patients and we look at the red blood cells in case there's hematuria. And this slide here shows us what is classical for really glomerular hematuria and that's dysmorphism. So you can see these RBCs where there is disruption in their membrane. They look fragmented, uh, dysmorphic, and there is a variable hemoglobinization. So some are well hemoglobinized, whereas others are really quite pale. So more than 20% dysmorphic RBCs in, uh, in urine is really suggestive of glomerular hematuria, which of course suggests to the clinician that there's a primary glomerular disease. Another hallmark of glomerular hematuria is the presence of the red blood cell cast. Here you can see the tam horsefall protein there, which has entrapped all these red blood cells, forming a beautiful RBC cast, indicative of proliferative glomerular disease. So these are solid clues that the problem starts in the glomeruli. Of course, whenever there's tubular interstitial involvement, you can have some tubular epithelial cell shedding, and that can be picked up as tubular epithelial cell cast in the urine. And these casts degenerate to form fine as well as coarsely granular casts, which can also be picked up in the urine. 
In later stages, particularly in patients with chronic renal failure, you can even get these broad or waxy casts. So this slide really shows us how these casts evolve from cellular casts, whether they are WBC, tubular epithelial cell or RBCs. And as these cells degenerate, you get the coarse, the fine and then the waxy casts. So if a patient does have primary glomerular disease with significant proteinuria, how does that really cause tubular interstitial damage? This slide shows us the mechanism. Of course, anatomical disruption. You now have obstruction of tubular lumina by casts, like we've just seen, which will cause back pressure and damage to the glomeruli, as well as direct effects of these proteins, which are tubular toxic, as well as non-specific effects associated with resorption of all these massive amount of protein, like lysosomal rupture, mitochondrial damage resulting in energy depletion. So all of these factors together result in tubular interstitial damage. What happens once the tubular interstitial damage starts, it really is a vicious cycle. There's loss of peritubular capillaries in these collagenized areas. There's impairment of oxygen supply because of increased diffusion distance between the peritubular capillaries and the tubular cells. All of these factors contribute to an ischemic state in the tubular interstitium, which of course will propagate injury and fibrosis. So that's really how the primary glomerular disease of prote and proteinuria cause downstream tubular interstitial damage. So now let's look at tubular interstitial nephritis in a different way. Let's look at acute or chronic. Clinically, we can differentiate it based on the clinical onset, whereas acute would have a rapid clinical onset, chronic would be more insidious. If we have tissue to look at, then the presence of edema uh, suggests acute, whereas fibrosis suggests chronic. The nature of the inflammatory infiltrate does help us to differentiate to some extent, wherein neutrophils, eosinophils are expected in more of acute involvement. But you can also get a predominant lymphocyte. Uh, infiltrate and in chronic you really do get more mononuclear cells that's the lymphocytes and plasma cells and in acute you would see focal tubular necrosis versus atrophy in chronic so these are some features which help us differentiate acute and chronic if you look at this slide this is i think this is really important because if you look at all cases of acute renal failure you can see how important the tubular interstitial compartment really is in arfs it's contributing to nearly 95 percent of cases uh, of acute renal failure, whereas the glomerular and vascular compartment contribute uh, less than 7%. So this is a very important compartment to be looking at. And these are the kind of biopsies we get. So this biopsy is from a patient uh, who had an acute tubular interstitial nephritis. You can see the glomerulus here, which is relatively unremarkable. And the interstitium is suffused by inflammatory cells, a lot of blue cells there. And you can really barely make out the tubular basement membrane or the tubules. On a closer look, you can see the inflammatory infiltrate is quite mixed. Here is a plasma cell. There's your yellow arrow or yellow star for that. Uh, we've got a lot of eosinophils there. So we've got a mixed inflammatory infiltrate and you can see them hitting the tubules. That's tubulitis uh, along with some interstitial edema and lack of collagenization. So all these factors together put together make a diagnosis of acute tubular interstitial nephritis. What do we see in chronic? Like I discussed, you now start seeing collagenization of the interstitium. You've got all this pink material, which is collagen. You still have some inflammation there and you still have your tubulitis. So it's really fibrosis, which is the hallmark of now chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. So we've looked at TIN in two ways. We've looked at primary versus secondary, acute versus chronic. Now let's get into the important causes. This is a very long list, difficult to remember, but the things we do need to remember. Toxins particularly drugs and heavy metals, metabolic diseases, we'll go into details of this, infections, certain physical factors, particularly obstruction and radiation, neoplasms, some immunological reactions, and we'll discuss some newer entities in this, and then of course some genetic causes of tubular interstitial nephritis. Let's start with drugs. Acute drug-induced interstitial nephritis was first described with sulfonamides and it's also been described with synthetic penicillins like methicillin ampicillin, rifampicin component of ATT, thiazide diuretics and NSAIDs. You note here that the two of these are also known to cause a granulomatous response and we'll discuss that later. But what do patients usually present as? After exposure to the drug, in a period of approximately 15 days, they would present with fever, a skin rash, and eosinophilia on peripheral blood examination. 
And in terms of urinary findings, we may find a hematuria, mild tubular level proteinurias, and presence of a lot of pus cells, usually rich in eosinophils in the urine. So we do get urine examinations where we are particularly asked to look for eosinophils. And if you do a creatinine blood urea, you'd find evidence of renal dysfunction with oliguria in 50% of patients. And that's what it looks like to us under the microscope. Here it's definitely an acute interstitial nephritis, a lot of eosinophils there, and they're hitting the tubules as well, causing a tubulitis. So eosinophils are a hallmark of an acute drug-induced interstitial nephritis. In some cases, for example, with methicillin, you can see presence of ill-defined granulomas, like you can see here in this slide. What is a pathogenesis? It's basically a hypersensitivity reaction. And the drug can interact with the tubules in four ways. Either it can be a haptin, which binds with a tubular western membrane antigen, forming a neoantigen against which an immunological response occurs. Or there could be the mechanism of molecular mimicry, where the drug really mimics an endogenous antigen of the tubular western membrane. Or the drug gets entrapped in the TBMs, and this planted or trapped antigen evokes an antibody response, causing tubular damage. Or the drug in circulation, um, there's a response of circulating antibodies and the immune complexes come and deposit in the tubular interstitium. So very similar to the glomerulonephritis pathogenesis. But by all these mechanisms, really what we're eliciting is a hypersensitivity reaction. If it's a type 1, then you get a lot of eosinophils like I've shown you in this slide. And in some drugs, there would be a type 4 reaction where you get more of a granulomatous response. And if you're still in the acute phase, the treatment is, is just removing the offending drug from the patient system. Now we move on to another very classic involvement of the kidney and the tubular interstitium in the form of analgesic nephropathy. This was first described to phenacetin. It's also been described with acetaminophen, which is a metabolite of phenacetin, aspirin, and even caffeine. The difference from an acute drug-induced hypersensitivity type of interstitial nephritis here is that this one does require large amounts of antipyretics, usually a mixture of at least two, and for a longer duration. Usually, it's seven years of abuse, which is required for a person to develop an analgesic nephropathy. And of course, it has a more chronic presentation with insidious onset anemia hypertension. You may get renal colic, and I'll explain why, with some hematuria and, of course, patients can develop a UTI. What's the pathogenesis? The acetaminophen is known to be directly toxic by covalent binding to the tubular interstitium and causes oxidative damage. Whereas aspirin, which has an anti-prostaglandin effect, it would inhibit vasodilation and cause an ischemic tubular interstitium, which would of course propagate fibrosis. But what is classical for analgesic nephropathy is papillary necrosis. This can also contribute to damage because it can cause downstream obstruction and worsen the chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. Now, when we talk about papillary necrosis, we all need to remember that there are at least two or three actually important differential diagnoses for papillary necrosis other than analgesic nephropathy. This includes diabetic papillary necrosis, sickle cell anemia, and acute pyelonephritis, which can also show papillary necrosis. If we think about diabetic papillary necrosis, in diabetes, really, uh, the difference is that the papillae show a homogeneous stage of papillary damage, whereas in analgesic nephropathy, you see various stages of necrosis, calcification, fragmentation, and sloughing. Uh, what we need to remember is that in a small percentage of cases of analgesic nephropathy, patients may develop transitional cell carcinoma. So these gross images uh, are basically top one is of an analgesic nephropathy where here you can see a hemorrhagic necrotic papillae uh, on this side and on the other side you really have a more calcified so uh, so you have different stages of involvement whereas in the diabetic patients like you can see in this image below you have uniformly calcified papillae that's diabetic papillary necrosis and on the right here you have a whole mount image of an acutely necrotic papilla right there now, as we move on, we talk about nephropathy associated with NSAIDs. Uh, NSAIDs are basically, as we know, prostaglandin synthase inhibitors. We exclude aspirin from this group of disorders. And usually they require months of exposure. 
The pathogenesis, of course, is that these cyclooxygenase inhibitors inhibit uh, COX-2, which is found normally in medullary interstitial cells, the macula densa, thin ascending loop of Henle, as well as smooth muscle and endothelial cells uh, in the kidney. These patients present more with an acute renal failure with variable amounts of proteinuria. The pathogenesis is the uh, inhibition of the vasodilation by prostaglandins. And in some cases, you can also get an acute hypersensitivity type of reaction. And interestingly, in this acute hypersensitivity reaction, eosinophils will be less and granulomatous inflammation is more common with NSAIDs. Rarely, there are descriptions of minimal change disease or membranous nephropathy developing post long term NSAID abuse. And this is a patient who did show photocyte effacement on electron microscopy uh, with extensive proteinuria in uh, after NSA abuse. Right, as we move on, we, we really talked about the drugs causing primary tibial interstitial nephritis. Let's move on to some infections. So in this slide, you can see CMV infecting the tubular epithelial cells causing classic cytomegaly, nucleomegaly and uh, a brick red nuclear inclusion. BK polyoma virus, an infection which is mostly important in the context of post renal transplant and you can see this uh, smudgy basophilic inclusion in a tubular nucleus and the response in the form of the tubular interstitial nephritis. And we use SV40T antigen immunostaining to highlight this infection in the tubules. In a country like India, TB is still prevalent and you can see a granulomatous uh, response in the tubular distichium in patients infected with renal tuberculosis. And of course, on Z Nielsen staining, if you can demonstrate the acid fast bacillus, you've got your diagnosis. Let's move on to some metabolic causes of tubular distichial nephritis. The first and very important cause is urate nephropathy, which will of course occur in patients with hyperuricemia. Uh, in the acute uric acid nephropathy, this precipitation of the uric acid in collecting ducts in the acidic pH leading to obstruction and acute renal failure. And this is a common a complication in patients with leukemia lymphoma on chemotherapy because these are rapidly proliferating tumors and the chemotherapy causing extensive cell death causes release of ex a large amounts of uric acid into the circulation. On the other hand, a chronic urate nephropathy, also called gouty nephropathy, similar to the joint involvement that you can get in gout, you can find birefringent needle-like crystals of monosodium urate inducing atophis and fibrosis in the tubular interstitium. And of course, when there's excess urate, you can just get urate stones or nephrolithiasis, which can also damage the kidney. So in this uh, image, you can see really atophis with the birefringent needle-like crystals and the fibrosis and inflammatory response around them. The second important metabolic disorder which hits the kidneys is nephrocalcinosis. And this excess calcium can come in uh, secondary to hyperparathyroidism, multiple myeloma with uh, bony lytic lesions, vitamin D intoxication, uh, metastatic bone disease following any tumor which goes to the bone like an RCC or prostate cancer, excess calcium intake which we call the milk alkali syndrome. And this excess calcium really causes intracellular tubular damage because of damage to the mitochondria. And the calcified debris can cause obstruction and you can have the development of stones and nephrolithiasis. So these are the various ways in which it can affect the kidney. And that's what it looks like to us. This patient has extensive uh, calcinosis and it can be seen as this granary basophilic material in the tubular interstitium. Primary hyperoxaluria. This is a heritable genetic defect in enzyme, uh, which is responsible for the metabolism of oxalate. So because of defective metabolism, you have excess oxalate, both in the circulation and in the urine. And you can see oxalate as these translucent uh, crystalline material in the tubules and in the interstitium here. And it can also be associated with severe nephrolithiasis. Right, we move on now to neoplasms. The kidney can be involved by non-renal neoplasms in indirect ways. This could be complication of the tumor itself. For example, hypercalcemia as a paraneoplastic uh, syndrome in patients with small cell carcinoma of the lung. You can get hyperuricemia, direct tumor invasion, for example, from an adrenal tumor, 
obstruction of the ureters uh, which can happen for example if a ca cervix extends into the pelvic cavity or you could have renal involvement due to complications of therapy of the neoplasm that would be for example radiation nephropathy hyperuricemia like i discussed in patients with leukemia lymphoma and chemotherapy chemotherapy itself can damage the kidneys can be quite renotoxic and then of course you can have infections in the immunosuppressed state because of the chemotherapy that these patients uh, are receiving but one classical involvement of the kidney is really multiple myeloma and this is known as cas nephropathy it's a common cause of renal insufficiency in these patients and basically what happens is the large amounts of the light chains or bestrons proteins they combine with tam phosphol proteins under acidic conditions to form obstructive casts along with being directly toxic to the tubular epithelial cells and this is what it really looks like to us in a biopsy you can see these pale weakly pass positive casts which demonstrate fracturing and these casts are really full of light chains and you can even see this epithelial response around them and you can see the chronic tubular interstitial damage which has ensued so this is a classical uh, picture of cast nephropathy if we move on to some immunological causes of tubular interstitial nephritis in the setting of renal uh, transplant a cellular rejection really does look like a tubular interstitial nephritis we got these lymphocytes which are attacking the tubules sarcoidosis this is an, another example of a granulomatous tubular interstitial nephritis with non necrotizing epithelial cell granulomas and again you can see the chronic tubular interstitial damage there in genetic causes we have medullary nephronophthisis the mckd complex or medullary cystic kidney disease complex this is autosomal recessive inheritance associated with mutations in the nph gene and you can see these medullary cysts both on gross and microscopy and the tubular interstitial nephritis in the background and a more recently described immunological condition which affects the kidney is the itg4 related tubular interstitial nephritis and this has very classical biopsy findings as you can see in this slide the glomeruli are completely uninvolved whereas the tubular interstitium shows extensive fibrosis which is characterized as storiform and it shows an infiltrate which is rich in plasma cells as well as a few eosinophils and these plasma cells will stain for igg4 by immunohistochemistry it is important to recognize this form of tubular interstitial nephritis because patients have demonstrated some response to steroids so to summarize the tubular interstitium is damaged by a wide variety of insults as we've seen we do need to remember some characteristic causes of primary tubular interstitial nephritis but it is also very important to remember that regardless of which compartment of the kidney is involved it is the chronicity in the tubular interstitium which really uh, dictates the patient's prognosis and how that kidney is going to do whether the insult started in the glomerular vascular or tubular interstitial compartment thank you